All right, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for coming out on this Saturday. I know there's a lot going on all over the city, so we really thank you for spending some time with us here at the Ogden. Um, we are here for a panel discussion with uh, four artists from Knowing Who We Are, the Contemporary Dialogue on the fifth floor of the Ogden Museum, which is part of a larger exhibition uh, called Knowing Who We Are, a 20th anniversary exhibition. And uh, this exhibition, I have, to, I have to do the obligatory thanks. Uh, this exhibition was uh, brought, was made possible through grants from the Terra Foundation for American Art, uh, who fosters inter intercultural dialogues and encourages transformative practices to extend narratives in American art. And also major sponsors, Roger Ogden and Ken Barnes and the Ogden Family Foundation, um, Tracy Copeland and Michael Wilkinson. Uh, and further continuing support from um, the New Orleans Tourism and Cultural Fund, which just came in recently. We're very excited that they saw the value in this exhibition as well. So um, I'm, I'm gonna start with a little introduction about uh, this exhibition and why we're here. Um, contemporary experiences of place and identity in the American South are myriad, situational, and decidedly in flux. And the selections from the Ogden Museum's permanent collection that we've uh, installed for our 20th anniversary uh, considers the many ways uh, artists throughout the region explore concepts of, pro concepts of process, uh, material, and identity through diverse media practices. And we have a diverse group of artists here uh, with us today. Uh, Knowing Who We Are tells the ever-changing story of the South through the evolving permanent collection of the Ogden Museum. It examines the development of visual arts in the American South from the 19th century actually the 18th century, we have a Salazar, which goes uh, back to the 18th century, but everything else is 19th century forward. Um, and in doing so, it shifts the focus from antiquated stereotypes of the region, period, style, and subject to address contemporary understanding of varied history, reflecting broader inclusivity and representation. Uh, this multi-floor installation explores the of, contributions of artists who were transformative yet largely unrecognized, all in consideration of the indomitable presence of place, uh, often an all-consuming and monolithic lens through which art produced in the South is perceived. Um, when I was thinking about this exhibition, I was thinking, I, I'm very literary in my approach to my process and curation, and so I was thinking about quotes that would inspire uh, this exhibition and give me some direction. And Ralph Ellison rose to the top uh, with a quote where he said, knowing where we are has a lot to do with our knowing who we are. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a powerful statement when you're considering art of a region. Um, but it's also a powerful statement when we're looking at ourselves at 20, 20 years old, you know, and where are we as an institution? And where, where did we begin? Where have we come? Uh, and with an institution that started with just 600 works as a donation from Roger Houston Ogden, we're just shy of 5,000 works of art in this permanent collection right now, which is uh, a, a it's the most comprehensive and important collection of art of the American South uh, in the nation. But Ralph Ellison might have won that competition, but there were some other quotes I was considering as well. Uh, and I'd like to share those with you because I think it'll play into what we're going to talk about here today. Eudora Welty said, one place comprehended can make us understand other places better. Sense of place gives equilibrium. Extended, it is sense of direction, too. Sally Mann, in her amazing book, Deep South, said, to identify a person as Southern suggests not only that her history is inescapable and transformative, but it is also impossibly present. Southerners live uneasily at the nexus between myth and reality, watching the mishmash amalgam of sorrow, humility, honor, graciousness, and renegade defiance play out against a backdrop of profligate physical beauty. And we just lost a luminary in the art world, one of my great heroes in curation, James Harithus, curator from Texas, just last week, but I think nine days ago. And I've quoted him a million times, and this quote inspires me constantly. Uh, it was from when he was curator of the Contemporary Art Museum, Houston, and Houston was absorbed with New York minimalism and European surrealism and wasn't really celebrating local artists. And he gave a, steps on, uh, he gave a speech on the steps of the cam where he said, how can we know what's good in the rest of the world if we don't even know what's good in our own backyard? 
And that has always given me a sense of direction and curation, not just to look outwards, but to look right here in the community and see what's great and celebrate that as well. And finally, the great Andre 3000, who at the 1995 Source Awards issued a prescient proclamation. The South got something to say. And as we see in the history of hip hop, the South definitely had something to say. And as you see on the walls of this museum, the South definitely has something to say. So with that in mind, I've asked four artists from Knowing Who We Are, the Contemporary Dialogue, to consider how a sense of place informs their work, the work that's included in this exhibition, but also their practice in general. Uh, so I'll introduce uh, each of these artists. Sorry, I'm, I'm taking up half of this panel just talking, but uh, we'll get to them shortly. So uh, at the very end down here, we have John Isaiah Walton. John Isaiah Walton is a painter who was born in 1985 here in New Orleans. He's the only native son on this panel uh, where he continues to live and work. He attended St. Aug uh, High School and graduated from Sarah T. Reed High School, uh, and he received a degree from Delgado in 2012. Uh, he's been a member of Second Story Gallery, The Front. He's a founding member of the Level Artist Collective in 2015. Uh, along with, I think we have another member of Level Artists, Horton Humbles, in the audience this evening. Yeah. Um, and um, that, that group of artists were uh, featured here at the Ogden in an exhibition in 2019. Um, he's lectured about his work uh, for the graduate program at UNC Chapel Hill. In 2019, he was in, also included in the Atlanta Biennial uh, at Atlanta Contemporary and was a solo of a subject museum, Humidity, at the Oro O'Keefe Museum in Biloxi. Um, he was also one of three artists featured in Delta Voices, Artists of the Mid-South, at the Arkansas Museum of Art, um, uh, suggested by the Ogden Museum. And right now you have a, you, tell us where your show is right now, ACA? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, he's got a, a solo exhibition that's up through May uh, at the ACA in Lafayette. And I haven't seen it yet, but I'm going before it closes uh, in mid-May, uh, along with the Colmar Circle here from the Ogden. Uh, his piece in the exhibition, Belazaire Reloaded, uh, explores the narrative surrounding an 1837 painting attributed to Jacques uh, Amon, known as Belazaire and the Fry Children. Um, this painting depicts an enslaved teen with three children of the young boy's owner, at some point, the, figures of the, enslaved boy, the figure of the enslaved boy was painted out of the composition, and recent conservation efforts restored the figure to the painting. Subsequent research revealed the identity of the sitters, including the name of the young man. His name was Belazare. The newly restored painting and the story of Belazare's life was, was revealed to, to the public for the first time at the Ogden Museum of Southern Art in, on July 1st, 2022, and it inspired the work that is now hanging uh, on fifth floor by John Isaiah Walton. Sitting right next to John Isaiah is Michael Wayne Meads. <laughs> Michael Meads was born in 1966 in Aniston, Alabama, on the southernmost slope of the Blue Ridge Mountains. Uh, he earned a BFA from Auburn University in 1987 and an MFA uh, from the State University of New York at Albany in 1990. After a brief stay in Brooklyn, Meads returned to his native Alabama, maintaining a studio in rural Eastaboga, Alabama. Uh, like many young men born in the Bible Belt, New Orleans held a deep allure to Meads uh, from an early age. He's quoted as saying, when I was a boy, I remember my father listening to the radio broadcast of Hellfire and Brimstone Baptist Minister preaching from Bourbon Street. Even at that young age, I knew there was something about New Orleans that was enticingly forbidden, as my father would warn me repeatedly never to go to that wicked city. He moved with his partner, Charles Canada, to the Crescent City in 1998, fulfilling a dream of deepening a relationship with place that has served as uh, a place that has served as setting, character, and muse for most of his work since. Meads further developed his art through both subject and medium in New Orleans. He drew from the culture and individuals around him, from the bars of the French Quarter to the ritual and history of Carnival. He became a New Orleans. He also became a master of graphite uh, and is now in exile in Abiquiu, New Mexico, but we're, we're gonna bring him, we're gonna bring him back. We're gonna bring him back. Um, the Intercession Two is a large scale drawing that was from his original show where he had the fifth floor of the Ogden Museum in 2015, an exhibition called Bent Not Broken. 
Um, and uh, it's a large narrative drawing executed with pencil and presented as a visual crescendo of a dramatic opera. The stage is set with a proscenium arch, drapery, and Corinthian columns. The setting is Mardi Gras Day in front of Café Lafitte's in Exile, a gay bar in New Orleans French Quarter. The scene depicts the artist and his husband dressed as plague doctors, pleading with death to intercede on behalf of a young man recently diagnosed with HIV. Um, we'll get into the more details about the work, but it is one of the most powerful narrative drawings in the collection, uh, and we're really proud to have it in the collection and in this exhibition. Right next to Michael is Mapo Kennard. <laughs> Mapo, Mapo grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. She received her first trainings in ceramics through Cleveland's Quaker-founded alternative school, the School on Magnolia. She apprenticed with several production potters before receiving her Bachelor of Fine Arts from the Massachusetts College of Art in 1984. She received her MFA from Ohio State University in um, 1994. Arriving in New Orleans in 95, she now serves as professor of art at Xavier University, a well-respected educator. Kinord has taught workshops in Matsua, Japan, as well as Haystack Mountain School of Crafts in Maine and the Penland School of Craft in North Carolina. Her contemplative clay project explores clay working as a meditative practice. A lifelong scholar, she's researched the traditional and contemporary art of Ghana extensively and has produced video documentation of the traditional pottery, kiln building, and ceramic, tech, uh, ceramic architecture of West Africa. Uh, to quote, she says, I work with clay because I love the physical interaction with the material. My current work body embodies the technical challenges as in creative and creative dynamic improvisation. Her, her organic clay improvisations can be considered three-dimensional drawings in space, and the resulting forms rep, uh, represent the physical evidence of the act of creation. Um, Mapo was subject of a solo exhibition on the fifth floor of the Ogden Museum in 2021 called Outside In, Improvisations in Space. It was an absolutely stunningly beautiful exhibition. I hope you got the opportunity to see it. She has two pieces in the show right now. Um, one is the only piece we can actually see on the, on the uh, landing up here called Stormy, uh, which was the first piece she created after Hurricane Katrina when she returned to her studio. And the second piece is on the fifth floor of the Ogden Museum, a collaboration with the great kinetic sculptor Lynn Emery, uh, which is a truly stunning piece. Um, and one of the greatest examples of, of collaboration I've ever seen uh, in sculpture. And finally, we have Christian Din. Born in 1992, Christian Den is Vietnamese-American ceramicist from Orlando, Florida. He received his BFA from, in 2017 from the University of uh, West Florida in Pensacola, uh, where he studied under the great Saunder, Greg Saunders, who was recently uh, featured on the fourth floor of the Ogden. Um, while studying at UWF, Den was nominated for the International Sculpture Center's Outstanding Student Achievement in Contemporary Sculpture Award, and he relocated to New Orleans in 2018 where he graduated from the MFA program at Tulane Universities. Um, Din's ceramic and sculptural work has been in numerous exhibitions throughout the Gulf Coast, including, and now for something new, at Lemieux and uh, Philic Phobic at the Pensacola Museum of Art. He was also featured in a solo exhibition, Nail Salon, here at the Ogden Museum in 2021. Uh, yeah, powerful, <laughs> powerful body of work. Um, and as he was defending his master's thesis at Tulane University, he was featured in uh, the New York Times uh, on an article about the Ogden. So they had to give him his degree. Like, there was no, he was like, yeah, I'm in the New York Times, guys. You, you, can't, you can't turn me down. Uh, so, and his piece was made specifically for the Ogden collection. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about it as well. So that was a lot. Where are we? <laughs> So basically, what we're, what we're here to talk about today is how does place um, inform your work, both the work in the exhibition and the work, uh, your larger uh, practice in general. And so I think we'll just start at the end of the table and move forward. Um, so uh, John Isaiah Walton, check, how, check. Does, how does place inform your work? I think, um 
my first body of work I started on, I was in um, Delgado, and that's, I guess it was like more surreal um, ideas um, about image making and stuff like that. I wind up doing like 15 or 12 paintings within like a semester, just like, you know, I, I guess I kind of knew how to use the materials I you know had in front of me. So with that, I had to like think about serious ideas and serious topics for my works going forward. So I kind of like tapped into like the ideas of like Mardi Gras and like political stuff because Katrina, you know, was like 2005, my first show I had in a gallery, I think it was like 2010 or 2011. And um, I kind of combined the ideas of Zulu and politicians, not really thinking about the outside um, entities that don't know nothing about, you know, Zulu um, culture within Mardi Gras. And um, I think the series after that, I did the Rodeo of Angola. And um, I got that idea from being a fan of Picasso's Rose Period and um, how he kind of predicted a lot of circus acts and stuff like that. And um, I guess you can say uh, he's like heavily influenced by the uh, bullfighting. So I wanted to incorporate our, I guess, our version of bullfighting with um, how the inmates deal with you know, live animals for the rodeo. So leading into that, I did this um, body work I just completed called the Black Paintings. At first it was only supposed to be like 12 paintings because, you know, I had a couple opportunities at like a university for a show and like solo shows here and there. And um, I think in 2021, I had a solo at Southeastern University and they counted how many pieces in there. It was like 43 or 44. I'm like, wow, I'm gonna just go ahead and get to 100. So within that, I created the work that's in the uh, fifth floor um, for the show here. And, um, you know, New Orleans, within that 100 body of work painting series, you know, it has ideas of international stuff and uh, uh, ideas of technology and, you know, ideas of the past, but I would say 60% of the, the works in the series has to do with, you know, my experience in New Orleans or just in the South. So um, I was at all my favorite artists from like art history and always saw that they tapped into the areas that you know, they lived in or visited as close to, you know, their native you know, land. So, you know, just try to take art history's uh, lessons and try to, you know, put it in today's, um, I guess, uh, in my works in today's work I'm doing right now. So that's out of South and, you know, the reason I'm at right now influences my work. So I'm, I'm glad it has because now I'm doing a new body work um, for this uh, collector to randomly hit me up on the, in I think on Google or Instagram or something like that. <laughs> He just typed in New Orleans Creole artists and uh, he hit me up. He gave me a whole packet full of stuff in a FedEx envelope. And uh, it's all about his genealogy and stuff from his family history. So I've just been working on that. And um, he's from Opelousas, but he lives in Ohio. So that was kind of a weird deal. But, you know, I guess it's happening into the rest of Louisiana now. So, Well, with your black paintings, I know um, throughout that body of work, you're looking at visibility and invisibility presence and absence, the figure and the void. Um, how did Belazaire, how did that inspire you to include that as a black painting? Like, did it just naturally fit into something you were already addressing or did it take you in a new direction in your work when you saw Jacquemont's painting and heard the, the story of Belazaire? Well, my fiance, she was a big fan of uh, Jeremy and Simeons. He's like a collector. Um, he, I guess, loaned the work here to be exhibited here um, for like, a, I think like what, four months? It, it went longer than that. We like, extended it twice. Oh, that's yeah, right, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, I did extend it. So I came here multiple times to like, you know, um, take pictures of it, study it. And um, cause I think the thing about the Belazare story is the fact that, you know, New Orleans is a Catholic city and the you know, archdiocese, you know, they keep records of um, slaves and stuff like that. So. You know, hearing the fact that he was covered up in a painting, you know, because he was he sold and then they like got rid of him in the portrait. They're not sure. There's some there's some apocryphal information from within the family that's just yeah. like that he he made someone angry. Yeah, that's why. But it was. it was painted over so much. They they don't know why he was painted over. I mean, we can guess why he was painted over, right? But uh, who wants to be reminded of that part of their family history? Probably. Yeah. No. But. Um, so we don't really know why, but the fact that he was and then that he stayed covered for so long, I think is the important part of the, part, the, the story. So talk a little bit about um, the code making and like how you're using the language of the computer world 
to express that narrative of erasure uh, in, in Belazare? Well, I took a computer gaming class, uh, God knows, I don't know what year it was, but not, not anytime soon. But a lot, of, a lot of the stuff in the program, we had to do like coding and stuff like that. So that was like already in the back of my mind when it came to like um, what works I need to create to finish out the rest of the series. And I'm on the internet all day. You know, I'm on IG, Instagram, you know. I'm kind of halfway on Facebook. But I know like the codings and stuff is on there and it records, everything we do on the internet is being recorded. And there's always O1s, binary codes that's like, you know, constructing all these ideas of what we're leaving on the internet. So with um, the painting being, um, um, I guess, um, I guess uh, in, a, in a phase of um, discovering values that are in there, I started to think about how different technologies if, within the art world that um, people use to make, make these discoveries of, you know, if, da Vinci, if it's a, a Da Vinci painting or something like that in somebody's attic. So, Seeing all that on the internet, also on YouTube, it, it kind of all clicked together to try to like make the image of him being discovered via technology, and and I also put like different wordings within the codings and stuff like that, because some people um, when you're writing scripts for different websites, they actually you know put underscore whatever input they need to put in. So you know I'm just playing with the ideas of you know making um, a coding for a uh, program that would probably rediscover Belazar. I don't know how they did it to rediscover him, but I'm kind of like imagining that right. that's probably what happened, so. Well, um, one of the things that we tried to do in this exhibition is place works in conversation with one another, and um, John Isaiah's piece has been placed in conversation with uh, Purvis Young. And Purvis Young was um, from Overtown, Miami, created an environment where he was telling uh, not only the story of Western art, uh, but the story of his community, whether it was the arrival of Haitian boat people or the drug plague that was happening in the communities, whatever, he was addressing it in his work and, um, and was a pioneer of kind of uh, urban expressionism, drawing from uh, Western, uh, uh, Western art traditions as well as uh, street art traditions in the United States. So um, I placed John there because I see him as the direct result uh, in painting of that urban expressionism uh, and those same narratives of place, of, a, of documenting your community. Do you feel that in your work? Or did... I do. And yeah. um, they had um, a situation to where I was curated in a group, not, not group show, but like a, um, a consecutive amount of shows with, featuring Southern artists by my old agent who passed away, Diego Cortez. He um, had curated. I think four shows in Brooklyn, New York in 2015. The first show was, I think, Purvis Young. The second show was Wilman Shawhorn. I was the third show, and oh, wow. Bruce yeah. Davenport was the fourth. So he was originally trying to get this show happening in Paris. Um, I guess he was called call it Four from New Orleans. It was supposed to be myself, Horton Humble, I think Carl Joe Williams, and Ayo Scott. But I guess he um, decided to go this route since the opportunity came up. So. Uh, to be next to Purvis, that was pretty tight because, you know, I had that, that little history of, like, being in a group of shows with him. And uh, I think um, Diego was trying to tap into something, you know, a little... I think people are now getting a little bit on the Southern art tip, but yeah, uh, yeah. he was, like, working with Lonnie Holly and, like, a host of other artists we, and stuff like we that. We tread a lot of the same ground. Uh, Diego, was, Diego was an amazing curator. So, um, but I play, you know, another... Uh, Two pieces I placed in conversation with one another were uh, Michael, Michael Meads and uh, Willie Birch, both massively scaled uh, drawings that were very narrative uh, in nature. Uh, so um, Michael's, Michael actually has more than just a drawing on fifth floor. Michael's included in the photo uh, exhibition on fourth floor as well with Dragstag, which is one of the, my favorite images in the photo collection here. Uh, from his East of Bogus series. So he's re represented on multiple floors in multiple mediums as well. But Michael, um, you, your work is so tied not just to the South, your, your work in phot photography was so tied to East of Boga, and then your work in graphite is deeply, deeply New Orleans uh, uh, in so many ways. Can you talk a little bit about how place fits into your uh, practice? Well, um, everything I do is storytelling. And uh, it, it may be somewhat symbolic, 
but it's always based in some form of an actual uh, personal experience. Uh, the drawing upstairs with the plague doctors, almost every costume in that drawing Charles and I have, have worn on the streets on Fat Tuesday. Um, so I try to make sure that whatever the story is, that it's, it's something that's been lived or observed. And uh, I might take characters that I've seen on the, the streets uh, on different occasions and then combine them into um, a collage uh, that tells the story. Um, if I haven't seen it, uh, I usually don't try to make something up. And um, moving to New Orleans is, is really what got me focused on the drawings uh, because I was in, I, my first job in New Orleans, I was a rather surly concierge in a rundown hotel uptown. And during the day, there was nothing going on, so I would bring my sketchbook there, and I would, using a ballpoint pen, I would do drawings of all the shenanigans that Charles and I got into the night before. <laughs> there was a lot of sketchbooks over a short amount of time. Uh, but that there, really... There were some of those drawings I couldn't even show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, there was, for that, for the bit not broken, there was definitely some back and forth on, the, on what I could get away with and what I couldn't get away with. And I got away with some. But um, it really got me back to... Uh, I had been painting, and I didn't really have the, the time or energy at that point to, to paint. So this gave me a chance to, to keep my skills up and, and get better, and also keeping better and better observations so that the, the drawings are not as, say, um, finished or nuanced as the one on the fifth floor. But when I go back at them, I look at them, the amount of detail that I was able to recall from the night before, and God, I couldn't do that now if you put a gun to my head. I mean, those brain cells have, <laughs> have slowly have fallen to the wayside. It's like, okay, I better take a picture of it. But... Uh, all the drawings, and of course my, my drawings and all of my artwork are, are based in Northern Renaissance and, and Northern Baroque. Uh, it's that kind of work with that kind of attention to precision and detail, but also um, storytelling. And uh, growing up in Alabama, I come from a family of uh, storytellers uh, and also a very um, somewhat unpleasant group of people that were, fam that, are, that were family members. And be, having lived in the desert now for over, over a decade, um, I'm kind of shifting my attention now to, to um, my family history. Um, not so much New Orleans. Uh, I've covered a lot of ground with New Orleans as far as what I wanted to say. Uh, there's, still a, there's still some things to be, to be made. But uh, recent events with my family has really turned me inward and documents that I've now been given about my family that are really dark and really disturbing uh, have really got my attention. And I'm trying to figure out how to translate those into my art. And the other question is, is also what's gonna be the best format for that process? Uh, the best way to tell the story uh, in the most powerful way. Uh, and um, uh, the New Orleans stuff is dark, but uh, it also is has a, has a festive quality. It's it's got a, a a somber quality to it, but it's also Mardi Gras, so you get all this mix, and it involves uh, so many people I know. But out in the desert, you have a lot of time to think, <laughs> and you have a lot of time by yourself. And that's given me time to really start reflecting on both um, my lived experience in New Orleans, my growing up in uh, a very, very dark part of um, Alabama, uh, and what all that means and how to uh, talk about it in an honest way, but also uh, in a way that uh, is kind of warts and all. It's like, to, much like with the New Orleans drawings, uh, tell the truth. And that's always how I've approached it, just tell the truth about it. Um, as uh, Flannery O'Connor once said that uh, um, if the South, the South may not be uh, uh, Christ-obsessed, but it's certainly Christ-haunted. And I take that approach with New Orleans and the South. Uh, I may not be obsessed with New Orleans and the South, but I'm certainly haunted by it. Mm -hmm. So New Orleans, uh, which I, I consider home, uh, and then Alabama, it's still something that, that is very haunting 
uh, and sometimes very scary because I've known some really um, unpleasant uh, people in that region. And I've also known some really incredible uh, people in not, not only New Orleans, but in the South. But uh, there's a lot of really dark stories that I've yet to tell because with recent events, um, I'm still trying to figure out a, uh, the emotionally and psychologically how to deal with some really ugly information and then uh, getting the strength of to actually address it and then be willing to put it out there in front of people. I mean, this is like your dirty laundry mm. and it's about your family and it's not pretty. Well, that takes us back to that Sally Mann quote about a history that is inescapable and formative, but also impossibly present. Right. And I guess being in the desert and it's very, very much present. Well, you're, just, you know, well. Uh, <laughs> you and the, you and the uh, ravens out there. The right? ravens, coyotes, and the tarantulas, by the way, yeah. my, which are my personal favorites. Um, yeah, I mean, we have a, uh, in my little studio, we've got a, a, a guest room that is, it's the Mardi Gras room. So all my Mardi Gras memorabilia and anything about Mardi Gras is used to decorate that, that guest room. So, you know, New Orleans is, is always on, on my mind. But there's a saying in New Mexico, is, uh, it's called the land of enchantment. But if you've lived there long enough, you realize it's actually the land of entrapment. <laughs> and about every time we've just about got figured out a way the goal is to eventually have a little place in New Orleans and spend the winter months here and then go back to the desert. Now, that sounds like a simple thing, but it's, it's not. And, uh, the universe has its own plan, and uh, we're trying to figure out how to work with that so that we can make that happen. But every time things have just about fallen into place, something screwy happens, and it mm. seems to it keeps us trapped there for some reason. So I think the universe has... I think eventually we will. I just hope that it's going to be sooner than later because <laughs> we're really ready to come home. <laughs> and you were really ready to leave after leaving, losing about half of your life's work in the floodwaters of Hurricane uh, Katrina. After Katrina. Which is why you went as far away from water as possible. Uh, into, it's true. Into uh, we're desert. about 7,000 feet up, and uh, yet somehow I still have plumbing problems. <laughs> Uh, I still have a leaking roof, uh, you know. It's all flat roofs, so the, yeah. the water is still, somehow water seems to follow me wherever I go. Uh, but yeah, after, after Katrina, um, we were in exile back in Alabama for about not quite two years. Then we moved back to New Orleans, and then uh, not long after that, Gustav came through, and we had to all evacuate again. And... Charles and I were back in Alabama, and fortunately, that only lasted a week and everybody was back home, but after that, we were both like, okay, that, that's enough, you know, we can't keep doing this or we're gonna kill ourselves. So then we made, we figured out getting out to the desert, and uh, it's not been easy, but it was the smart choice, maybe not the easy choice, and uh, it, can get, it can get lonely out there, and you have no idea how cold <laughs> and windy. Well, that, that isolation has allowed you to create a truly, truly powerful body of work, and uh, so we're, 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 uh, we're lucky uh, that, you, that you moved out to the desert there's, and created that work. So. There's, there's not much else to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, and speaking of um, <clears throat> Hurricane Katrina, um, my pose piece, which my pose work is... Um, really rooted firmly in the act of improvisation and explores space and form. It can be very gestural and abstract, but there's she also, surprisingly, uh, both of these ceramic artists, Mapo and Christian Din, incorporate a, a massive amount of narrative and storytelling into their practice. Um, but with, um, with Stormy, you see this undulating form, uh, the color of water, uh, and it's really about uh, coming home. Uh, and so, Mapo, it may be a little harder for us to access a sense of place in your work, and that's why I wanted your voice here, uh, because I know it's there. Could you share with us a little bit how place um, and, and the South and, and this place uh, informs your work? Um, it's like when, when I talk about improvisation, you know, New Orleans is the birthplace of jazz, and it's all about improvisation and being in the moment and feeling the energy. 
And so, you know, as, as much as I love working in clay, um, being a formal potter is really different than being a sculptor. And so, New Orleans kind of set me free in a lot of ways. You know, it's like, because I was jealous <laughs> of the musicians. Um, you know, this idea of being in the moment and working in collaboration and being inspired and, and really feeling stuff. And, and then also being inspired, you know, um, by artists like Jackson Pollock, who was all about movement. You know, it's like you're moving with the material and let yourself be moved by the material. So New Orleans, you know, you come here, you see the second line dancers, you see that undulation, you see that freedom, you see that stance, you know, the music. And so it gave me the opportunity to be inspired by that feeling. You know, it's like feeling it. Um, and it's, I would say New Orleans is, is connected to this vibration. You know, this place is vibrational. And to, to feel it, it's, you know, it's, it, it's allowed me a certain amount of freedom to be connected. Um, and in a strange way, Katrina, well, I had moved my mom down here. Um, my mom had been to New Orleans um, years ago, she, she grew up in New York, and my dad was from Mobile, Alabama, and he lived here in New Orleans, actually, when he was a child. And so, you know, those, <laughs> those two influences have, have been a part of, of, of me, and this idea of New Orleans being the root, you know, that it is the root of, of black culture so much. I mean, you know, the whole lot migration happen just to get away from the oppression, but our roots are here, literally in the ground, because we were digging in the ground. We were making our lives from the ground. And so, and clay comes from the ground, and you can't work with the material without it talking to you about where it's been and what it has held. And so, you know, all of that stuff sort of, sort of comes up through your fingers. Um, I know you've been working on a large project where you've actually been pulling mud from the Mississippi, uh, which I believe you can see across the street at the CAC currently. Can you talk a little bit about that process and that project? Um, there was an artist from Bolivia, uh, Carolina, and she is, um, she did an, there's an exhibition across the street, Undoing Time, that talks about incarceration. So when they asked me to produce the Adobe Bricks for, the, for her installation, uh, it made sense to get the actual clay from the Mississippi, which I had gotten before. So Christian, <laughs> uh, I, I pulled him in to help me, and we, we went down to the Mississippi to dig clay. And if anybody's familiar with the history of New Orleans, um, Algiers and Algiers Point is where a lot of African were sold into slavery. And so this idea of slavery and, you know, the whole prison system of re-enslavement, um, well, that was that connection. And again, you know, if we're talking about sense of place, you can't really escape that history. And so to honor that history by making it, you know, from the material from the Mississippi seemed really appropriate. Um, can you talk a little bit about, because I've never experienced a, a, an artist who collaborates so enthusiastically and so successfully as my Pope Canard. Um, you know, it just seems like she takes more joy in working with others than working in solitude sometimes, which is rare for a visual artist. But can you talk a little bit about the piece on the fifth floor and that experience of working with another New Orleans icon, Lynn Emery? Um, well, if anybody who's familiar with Lynn Emery knows that she is, you know, she is amazing. Um, her energy, her spirit uh, really, you know, worked well with her work. Her work was kinetic and like New Orleans was in motion. <laughs> and so um, she and I had known each other for years. She was, um, 
her history in terms of her relationship with John Scott, who back when the New Orleans Museum, um, City Park, even though black folks may help make City Park, which is evident in Alvarez's documentation in the Botanical Gardens, but we weren't allowed in City Park. And so um, John Scott, who was a student um, at Xavier, she made arrangements so that students could go to the museum. So she was an advocate for, for black artists, you know, back when that was not a popular thing to do. And as a woman, and then as a woman sculptor, you know, I really admired her, you know, her fortrightness to do what she wanted and to do it no matter what anybody said. So, you know, it's like, I wanna work with you, I love you. <laughs> and so again, like, I'm really jealous of, you know, that ability of artists, musicians, to be able to riff off each other and to be inspired by each other. And I had done a piece with um, Jackie Bishop because I really loved her work and she's an incredible painter and so I gave her a work for her to paint, two works. and. Yeah, and she like took it to a whole nother level. And, and that's, you know, that's one of the things that I'm really interested in now is collaborations. And did, did you collaborate also with Ron Bichet maybe? Else? Ron painted the interior of, of one of my sculptures. So, I'm in, yeah, I'm, I love the idea, you know, of being able to see what, you know, someone brings to the work, brings to the table, because it's always gonna be completely different. And like musicians, it's like, you know your instrument, you know, you have your talent, you know your thing, and then to put it in concert with another person who knows their thing, it's like you end up with this thing that is bigger than both of us. And so, um, Lynn uh, agreed, I had sent her actually a picture of a work, and she, was trying to figure out what she was going to do, and she gave me these forms that she was in, that she wanted to incorporate. And then I saw these forms, and I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, then I want to um, sort of echo some of the form that she had." So it was kind of it was an ability to kind of go back and forth in terms of a form and have the piece, you know, have the the ceramic work almost a platform for it to dance, but to dance in space, which is what, you know, it's like the second line, you don't dance, you're not dancing in the club, you going down the street, <laughs> you know, you moving, so. And with Stormy, um, the piece on the, on the terrace here, was that uh, meant to, uh, what, the, were the forms like the river, the, the water? The um, forms were like, you know, the, but it was more like how it was feeling. You know, that there was nothing, um, <laughs> everything was not predictable. And every, it was literally, the act of making it was my, was my therapy. Um, I had moved my mom down to New Orleans in, in 98. And so by the time Katrina had come, she had been in New Orleans and had been living in the French Quarter and having uh, a wonderful time there. And so um, we had to leave for Katrina, and then, you know, she kept saying, "I want to come home. I want to come home." And then she passed away on Valentine's Day after Katrina. And so having to come back to New Orleans and deal with my mother passing, and deal at the time I was married, and and my husband had to be in Baton Rouge, and so it was like folks were, and then my neighbors were gone, and people were gone, and the city was kind of like, it was a mess. And I was a mess. And, and working on this piece and, and just being able to have clay in my hands was the thing that grounded me. And so I just, you know, I just let it, let it move me as it did. Um, it's blue because it was the blues. <laughs> it was my way of singing the blues. Um, but in that blue, there is sparkle. Mm -hmm. And in that sparkle is the hope. Mm. Well, that's, that's pretty powerful. Um, Christian Din uh, has been working with you um, at Xavier recently and kind of stepping in as you took a sabbatical with your students. I know he's been working very, very hard. 
Uh, but hopefully y'all can, ho hopefully y'all can find maybe some time. I'd love to see that collaboration uh, in the future, maybe. So yeah, just a bug yeah, in your ear. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, but um, Christian, um, when when I when I, let me tell you a little backstory on Christian. So Christian, I had an introduction from um, Gregory Saunders, uh, who was his professor and recently featured on the fourth floor of the Ogden. Uh, to two young people that were moving here from Pensacola, Selena McCain, who is our, uh, works with me in curatorial now, and Christian Din, her partner. And um, I saw both of their works, and I loved both of their works. Um, and I wrote a letter of recommendation for you, right, for Tulane. Mm -hmm. You got into the program. And, you know, he's like, I want to show you what I've been doing. I'm like, okay, yeah, let's see. Let's see what you've been doing at Tulane. And this body of work nail salon he showed me, and it floored me blew me away of such a positive message about the Vietnamese community in America. It was Vietnamese American community. This was, um, and, and of course we know there's a very large population here. It's a very integral part of our culinary landscape and cultural landscape in New Orleans. And I thought this, this work really speaks to a part of our community that has not been represented on the walls of the museum. Let's get this on the walls as soon as possible. So I said, you got to finish three pieces, I think, in the next <laughs> two months, and you got a show. And, uh, and once we hung that show and this, this beautiful message and beautiful work, um, people started uh, texting him and saying, my grandmother cried when I saw uh, when she saw Vietnamese representation at the museum, or we're gonna bring our whole family to see it. And I, I felt we had really finally made that connection uh, to a community that, that, I've been, that the muse museum needs to serve, uh, that this was their place too. So it was one of the most powerful moments of connection with the community I've ever had in curation. So thank you uh, for allowing us to bring that message forth. But the piece you have created is directly tied to the Mississippi River, the Delta, and its connection with the Mekong. Can you talk a little bit about that connection and how place, uh, you know, the role of place in your larger body of work as well? Mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. So the piece that is in the show is probably the only piece that really um, thematically is um, directly tied to region. The rest of it is absolutely inspired um, by region um, and here in New Orleans specifically. So the whole nail salon um, project, I was thinking about it probably a year in advance before I ever actually even put anything down on paper. So we moved here, Selena and I moved here in 2018, um, but before that we were coming to New Orleans quite often. But when we moved here is when I really kind of discovered the Vietnamese community here. And it wasn't anything new to me in a way. It seemed so familiar. It was like um, I grew up here or something, just like how everything um, just flowed, how the stores were, you know, I just knew where to go somehow. Um, that was something I only had when I was a child. I grew up in St. Petersburg, Florida, which is the largest Vietnamese community. And I lived in a Vietnamese neighborhood. So every weekend, you know, the entire neighborhood would be at my grandparents' house. And, you know, that was just uh, how I grew up. And then I started moving around to other parts of Central Florida, Tampa and Orlando, which, you know, when I think about it, it does actually have a pretty large Vietnamese community, but it wasn't like necessarily um, neighborhoods of Vietnamese people, but maybe just some um, businesses and things like that itself. So, all that to be said, I was kind of disconnected from the Vietnamese community um, for quite a while, a lot of my young adult life. Um, and it wasn't until I started, or I won't, moved to Pensacola, um, more, you know, closer to New Orleans where we started coming over. And then when we moved to New Orleans itself is when I really got reconnected with the Vietnamese community, and which inspired me to really start moving into this direction about this body of work of the nail salon. And so, you know, I was thinking about it. I, I thought of the project in my head for about a year until I finally had the opportunity to start executing the work, fleshing out the ideas in like physical form. And so um, the pieces themselves might not necessarily have those direct connections here or there about like region itself, but everything about it um, was inspired about this move to New Orleans and being in this culture. 
Um, the piece upstairs is about the Mississippi River. Um, I like the idea, and this is actually in a couple of my other pieces, of doing or like creating subject matter that has been done often. Right? There's a lot of pieces about the river, um, and other things in my work uh, touches on very like New Orleans themes. I have a piece about shrimp, and I just thought it's, it's kind of comical in a way. Like, how many pieces of shrimp have you seen in New Orleans? But I wanted to like do a take on that of like. Uh, shrimp from like the context of like a Vietnamese American standpoint and so I like to kind of play those lines of like cliche in a way but like kind of my own take on it so the idea of the river itself is a uh, maybe a little bit of different take of what you typically see about um, the Mississippi River but I wanted to touch on these ideas of hidden beauty or hidden gems within the river itself so the idea is touching on um, the idea of pearls, pearls within um, the sou southern culture and also within the Vietnamese culture. And so the idea uh, of pearls, right, it's something that gets inside of um, the muscles and becomes, I guess, what they call it, an irritation in a way. But over time, it cultivates into these beautiful gems that we then harvest, right, and find inside of them, but hidden underneath the waters for a long period of time. And I took that as kind of um, this idea uh, of the Vietnamese community themselves, right, um, in a way like translated like, to the U.S. in the South because of similar climates, right, similar regions to Vietnam, um, the river itself, um, and so, yeah, industry. But over time, right, it's developed more than that, past those um, first entry points, which was, that seemed like, the most reasonable place to relocate um, these refugees. Um, and over time, cultivating this community, community, this beautiful community into what we know now um, that is so in, uh, integrated into the city, right? Seamless, I, I don't think you can really picture it without it now, to this beautiful gem, right? This pearl of a community. And so that was the idea of this piece um, that I made specifically for this show. Thank I don't you. know. Yeah. <laughs> it's a powerful piece, too. So, yeah. um, well, it's 3 o'clock, so I think I'll open it up uh, to the audience. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for these guys, so throw them out here. Any questions for this group? No one? Hi, right, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope you, um, if you, go ahead. I gotta, I gotta do a plug. Yeah, please do. Um, one of the, the people in the audience here is visiting from North Carolina, Car <laughs> Carola. And she is, um, if you've never heard of the Material Institute, it is like this amazing place. It's over on Port Street and Galvez. And so she's doing indigo dyeing. And I am sporting um, some of her creations and this idea of like clay, the stuff that grows from the earth, and as a result, like you've got amazing stuff. So she's doing a series of workshops at the Material Institute, and thank you, Carola, for dressing me today. I appreciate it. And Norma, Norma Hedrick, sitting right across from her, is one of is you know the major coordinator of the fashion uh, section of because they do music too. But it's an amazing place if you haven't checked out Instagram the Material Institute. Thank you for being with us. And I, that was the first thing I, when, when Mapo was getting out of her car, I was like, look at that indigo, it looks beautiful. And she told me immediately that, uh, that her friend was making this in workshops. So beautiful work and thank you for being here. James, you have a question. Where did you source? Where did you source the clay for you the Adobe the, project? For, I guess uh, Alger's Point. Like, if you go right across the street, there's a church. You, you know where people walk along the levee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you have to go at low tide, <laughs> 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 um, because otherwise you won't see it. But it's really dense. I mean, it's not like it's sticky. It's you know, you go to the edge of the river, and you'll see where there's no trees or things that are, are growing there. I mean, it does grow through the stuff, but there's a section where you can pull it up 
and it won't have all that roots and stuff like that. But there is a, um, um, there was a Brazilian artist. Um, Oh God! Um, the guy Paolo. that did the watermelons, yeah, yeah Paolo. Paolo, yeah. And we we went there to dig. We went there to dig um, mm -hmm. some clay, and that because that's like an hour away. It's a good. Yeah. It's a good. Yeah, it's a good distance. But that stuff is even more. That stuff is. It's it's a better clay than the this stuff. With And it makes the clay. Yeah. That gas is the stuff that breaks the rocks down to make, yeah. Wow. Yeah, uh, let me get the, yeah. the exact address of your location, and I'm happy yeah, to check it out. Careful what you offer. My poe will put you to work. <laughs> Bradley, I have a question. Yes. I know you asked us all the questions today, but I have a question for you. Oh, God. All right. Uh, it's not bad. Um, so, you know, we call art today contemporary art, right? Mm -hmm. And um, art in the South has, like, a, um, a different tone, different themes that's separate from the world, you know, because the region, I guess it goes from like Texas, Oklahoma, all the way to like, what, Florida? Baltimore, yeah. Yeah, so um, I know you got vernacular art, uh, art done by artists um, who got educations and stuff like that, but um, could we call Southern art, like Southern contemporary art? Just give it like, do you think that's a good like uh, label to put on it for the time? Yeah, I mean, so the, so there, there are definitely, there's definitely a contemporary dialogue happening in, within Southern art, uh, absolutely. And I, you know, this is a question that we, this is what this museum does every single day, is we consider the concept of Southern art. It, is, is there such a thing, you know? I've had, uh, I've had people tell me that, forget all that regionalist ideas, we live in a, a totally connected world, you know, there is no separation of region, but I don't think that's right. I think if you look at, if you look at language and dialect, as it moves across the landscape, it has its own taste. If you listen to hip hop, hip hop in Texas and Baltimore is completely different. If you listen to, uh, you know, Americana, the Americana of the Appalachians and the Americana of the South Texas are, are two totally different musical uh, forms, but they are of that place. So I think even if you're working in abstraction, even if you're working in pure abstraction, your energy is drawn from the place you are, you know? Um, and so I believe that place affects the work of an artist, whether they admit it or realize it or not, you know? Um, so that's kind of what we were exploring on a daily basis and, and hope to continue to explore here at the museum. So. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I was so uh, struck listening to all of you about how, um, how well you were able to explain sort of how, what you're doing, uh, who, you know, who you are, and what, what happened, you know, like the Katrina happens, and the mother dies, you know, different personal events, what things took place. And I was just wondering what, I'll ask you, Mike, uh, what, you, what insights you got out of well, the most important thing is is that uh, the South as a region is still very much uh, vibrant, alive, and very relevant. And it also has to be uh, defended and nurtured and taken care of. And the wonderful people on this panel whose work is so very different from what I do, but 
as with any uh, really, really great work, you can find something in all of it that you see in yourself. Uh, and there's uh, so many artists in the collection that work so very differently from, from what I do, but their work fascinates me and compels me uh, as much as anything else. But uh, I think No the South is, is a, a distinct uh, region more than any other, and uh, uh, it certainly has the best food. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and I think, I think you know, like Eudora Welty said, um, and I quoted earlier, one place comprehended can make, make us understand other places better. I think, you know, with all of the complicated and often really painful uh, history in the American South, if we can face that history and reconcile it with the present and reconcile it with the future, uh, while honesty, honestly looking at our past, we can understand this place we can definitely understand the rest of this nation i think we're you know this this is is really the should be the the framework uh towards uh reconciliation and healing in this country if, if you can wrap your head around the south then the rest should fall in pretty easily right so uh and these these artists are doing that hard work every day uh within their practice um so any anyone else anything else well, thank you all. Thank you very much for being here. Go upstairs and see the show.